Hello, everyone. Long before I knew the meaning of the word displaced, my life had been displaced. It happened way before I was born, before even my parents were born, actually. It happened in the time of my grand great-grandparents when they woke up one day and were told to abandon all their ancient beliefs by the, new, by the force of the new belief, which in this case was the American Baptist Mission, who arrived in our lands in the 1870s to convert us savage natives to Christianity. I can't imagine what this had, what this did to the psyche of my ancestors who were told that everything that they believed to be true and real was now wrong and a sin. There are no records of the impact this had on my people, but in my travels to the villages, I met an elder tattooed woman with whom I was sharing our experiences of getting tattooed. And this grand old lady, who was near 100 years old, recalled the day when, as a little girl, she was about to receive her first tattoo. The joy of being old enough to get tattooed and be part and, and be a full-fledged member of her community. But she also recounted the day when the missionaries arrived in her village. And too soon, she was in school being berated for messing up her face, that is, wearing her facial tattoos. The pain, you know, I could still feel the, I could feel the pain when she recounted that she ran to the corner to hide and tried to erase the markings on her face, only to discover with dismay that these were permanent markings and that every day she would, she would face condemnation for wearing the tattoos of her clan on her face. So the wounds of the past still hurt in this present day and age. I was born in the Ao Naga township of Mukukchung in northern Nagaland. But while still a child, my parents moved to another state, Meghalaya, that's where I was born. And they did this because my mother took up a teaching job as the lecturer in the English department of the university, of the then only university in the hills, which was called the Northeastern Hill University. And so, needless to say, I was enrolled in a convent school, and uh, the nuns threatened us with punishment if we were to speak our native tongue. And uh, we were even told to speak only English at home. And so I grew up knowing only slightly more than my non-Naga friends about my own culture and my roots. Sure, we were eating Naga food at home, and my mom spoke to us in the, in the language of my village, Chanki. But still, I did not have this deep sense of who my people were. The turning point of my reconnection with my roots happened in a very unexpected way. My mother received a Fulbright scholarship and went to the US of A to spend some time with the Ojibwe people in Minnesota. When she returned, she came back with many books on the folklore of the native peoples of, the America, of, the, of America and brought for me and my sister feather earrings and turtle pendants and even dream catchers. I read these books from cover to cover and uh, even tried to fashion out a dream catcher for myself, feeling this connection with my native brothers and sisters in a faraway land. This Ojibwe experience was actually what inspired my mother to look into the traditions of our Naga tribe, which is the Ao. So she, whenever she had the time and the means, she visited all the villages and met all the elders and gathered as much information as she could. And this resulted in the book, The Ao Naga Oral Tradition, which was first published in 1999. And so finally, I had a book to read in English about my own people. My journey back to my roots was further fueled by my fascination for the tattoo art. I had always wanted a tattoo on my skin, 
but I always held back from getting, you know, from just flipping through a catalog and picking up a pattern and getting it tattooed on me. It had to have more meaning. So when one day my, my sister who was studying sociology handed me a book by J.P. Mills on the Ao Nagas, I was ecstatic because in it was a small section on the Ao Naga tattoo tradition. And there were even some sketches of the three variations of Ao Naga tattoo patterns. I was really so happy because I had found the tattoo I knew I was meant to wear. Um, I, uh, the other thing that really, that really uh, brought me close to my roots was this folklore book project that I, that I was asked to do in 2015 when I actually came back to Nagaland to live there. This was really, I think, divine providence because out of the eight tattooing peoples of the Nagas, six belonged, uh, six live in Eastern Nagaland. So I was really, really happy to be meeting the six people who were, who once used to practice the tattoo art. Um, me and my team, team, we traveled for about five months to about 70 villages, collecting all the stories, songs, and real life accounts of the people of Eastern Nagaland. And it took me another five months to transcribe and translate the stories and try to fashion them out into story form. This really, this experience of working on this book project of Eastern Nagaland was really the link that bonded me to my roots. It also, it, because it was such a strong reference to the not so traditional past of my people, because you know, there are 16 uh, tribes in Nagaland, each with its own distinct culture, but many, many share, many tribes share common stories. And so working on this project really made me understand and give me an inkling as to how things were in the past and how things were in the not so traditional past of my people. Um, that said, I'd like to say that being displaced is, re is really relative. I say this because I think all of us are displaced in one way or the other at any given point in time. Take me for example. I'm, so, I'm standing here far away, miles away from home, but feeling right at home with this warm sense of belonging among all my native brothers and sisters here in this beautiful gathering and event. So before I move on to say the poetry from Nagaland, I'd like to just take this moment to thank David and the wonderful team who have been working so hard to make indigenous celebration happen. Okay. I will just read you a short poem uh, which I collected from a Konyak village in Eastern Nagaland called Chen Wet New. And this is from the book, The Folklore of Eastern Nagaland. Actually, this morning, I was just wondering what I should read because I hadn't really prepared. And uh, spontaneously, I, uh, I, I found this and I thought uh, it could relate to all of us. Manka mei fe yan tan ma wan ling fao to ko en ta i him lao i niya sap pe nak tat la amai ngo li li po tut long tu chui la he mei lam en tong Oh, my lover, oh, the breakup to desolate fields don't bid me go, mother no voice in my ear, my lovers I used to hear no stone, no tree to shore up my faint heart. I am done. I'd now like to read you a poem from the Book of Songs, which are the collected, which contains the collected poems of poet and writer Tamsala Ao, who also happens to be my mother. This poem is called The Blood of Other Days, and it refers to the headhunting practice that the Nagas once used to have. 
but it also refers to the situation in Nagaland because after the British subjugated my people and they were finally going to go away, my people were so happy that they were going to be free again, only to find that they were now under the Indian nation. So in 1946, one year before Indian independence, the Naga National Council was formed to fight for the freedom of my people. What happened then was that we did come under the Naga uh, Indian nation, and then the central government sent in the armed forces to Nagaland, and the Armed Forces Special Powers Act is still in place. So since 1946, to the present day, there is conflict in Nagaland, and a lot of blood has been shed. Okay. In the bygone days of the other life, before the advent of the word, spilling the blood of foes was the honor code. Head takers became acclaimed tribal heroes, earning the merit to wear special cloths and ornaments and live in grand houses. We believed that our gods lived in the various forms of nature, nature whom we worshipped with unquestioning faith. Then came a tribe of strangers into our primordial territories, armed with only a book and promises of a land called heaven. Declaring that our trees and mountains, rocks and rivers were no gods, and that our songs and stories nothing but tedious, primitive nonsense. We listened in confusion to the new stories and too soon allowed our knowledge of other days to be trivialized into taboo. We no longer dared to sing our old songs in worship to familiar spirits of the land or in praise of our legendary heroes. And if we ever told stories, it was to the silent forests and our songs were heard only by the passing wind in a land swept clean of ancient gods. Stripped of all our basic certainties, we strayed from our old ways and let our soul mountain recede into a tiny ant hill. And we schooled our minds to become the ideal tabula rasa on which the strange intruders began scripting a new history. We stifled our natural articulations, turned away from our ancestral gods, and abandoned accustomed rituals, beguiled by the promise of a new heaven. We borrowed their minds, aped their manners, adopted their gods, and became perfect mimics. Discarded our ancient practice of etching on wood and stone, and learned instead to scratch on paper in premature tryst with a magic script. But a mere century of negation proved inadequate to erase the imprints of intrinsic identities stamped on minds since time began. The suppressed resonance of old songs and the insight of primitive stories resurface to accuse leased out minds of treason against the essential self. In the reawakened songs and stories, a new breed of cultural heroes articulate a different discourse and redesignate new enemies. Demanding reinstatement of customary identity and restoration of ancestral ground as a belligerent postscript to re recent history. In the agony of the rebirth, our hills and valleys reverberate with death-dealing shrieks of unfamiliar arms as the throwback generation resurrects the blood of other days. Yeah. I would like to now leave you with a very short folk song. It's a song in the old language of my village, Chunky. And it's a song sung by a captive maiden from my village held in a distant land. Chenni Watali no Chenni Yanko 
Son, O oh son, as you go your way, if you should meet the one who bore me, tell her across the waters on the high cliffs of a distant land blooms her flower. Thank you so much for listening. It's a privilege to be here with you. Thank you.